Hello, everyone. Just uh, wanted to bring everyone's attention. Uh, we're going to be having Cassandra Young um, do her talk, Essential Guardrails for ADBS Organizations. Uh, before we have the talk, just a few quick announcements. Uh, just for folks' awareness, there is currently a lockpicking uh, village going on on the left-hand side if you walk outside the doors uh, that you can spend your day with. And there's also a maker space uh, that has a bunch of badges you can work on with various soldering equipment and everything else set up at this particular time. Uh, I also want to take a minute to thank some of our sponsors. Um, we have Microsoft, uh, Target, Intel Security, MongoDB, Verizon, Amazon, uh, Toyota, and uh, Jupyter Systems, all sitting here um, sponsoring this particular track and everything today. Thank you very much from the Dian Initiative and um, making sure that we can reach out to everyone. If anyone is uh, watching this on any of our live streams right now, I'll be in the Discord monitoring for any questions for the Q&A period and everything uh, to bring to Cassandra's attention. Uh, thank you all very much, and uh, meet Cassandra. Here you go. Thanks. Thank you very much, Bree. Good, happy to be here. So, uh, like mentioned, I'm Cassandra, aka Muteki online. I use them interchangeably, I'll answer to both, or just hey you, works too. Uh, and I'm here to talk to you about AWS organizations. So this, is a, this title's a bit of a misnomer, um, because, or maybe a little misleading, because there are actual features called AWS organizations, but it could be your a organization in AWS. Guardrails is also another feature. So I'm gonna be talking about guardrails in the general sense, in that, that more um, generic, uh, definition. So <laughs> I had a tradition years ago to start a present start presentations with a quote and I love this one because it encapsulates both the feeling of being in technology in general, being in the cloud, but also uh, giving presentations for me. So this is actually the, one of the first live presentations I've done since before the pandemic and I'm really excited to be here sharing what I have learned about AWS and all the things that excite me about it. Um, so, and again, that's my name, that's my handle. Um, I can be reached on the bottom, a little hard to see, it, but we'll, slides will be posted after as well. Um, technically, my title is Senior Scientist at Security Risk Advisors. Um, I do cybersecurity consulting, and my focus is cloud security. Imagine that. Um, <laughs> I also got a master's in computer science, so I have a little bit of a development experience too. Um, and I currently am one of the directors and uh, program lead at Blue Team Village at DEF CON. So <laughs> if you'll be at DEF CON, definitely stop by and say hi. I might be running around like a chicken with my head cut off though, just fair warning. Um, I love travel, I love excitement, um, you know, kind of hence the quote, I think. I, I thrive on things that are new and changing and jumping in the deep end with things I don't really know that well. So it's my, it's my source of inspiration right there. So just a really quick overview of what we're gonna be talking about today. I'm gonna to talk very briefly about ba like cloud basics, kind of um, the shared responsibility model, just a few other of those topics, but I'm gonna keep it focused on what the actual guardrails are. So we're gonna talk a little bit about accounts and account security, but mostly we're gonna focus on that third and fourth bullet point, which are organizations, organizational units, and service control policies. And then wrap up with a few smaller sections, kind of rounding that out as well. Um, so to get into it, what is cloud? It's everyone else's computer, right? And it's automatically secure, or it's automatically insecure, depending on which side of the joke you wanna be on. Neither, none of that is true. <laughs> it wouldn't be a cloud security talk without the shared responsibility model. Essentially, everything in the cloud is uh, on a scale of how much, to what extent you can actually access underlying um, infrastructure and the operating system uh, of a service. And on the other extreme end, you have services uh, that are, you know, essentially you, you're buying a, a whole package of software and you really have very little uh, responsibility for any of the, the setup of that service um, aside from kind of controlling your own data and um, can basic configuration. And there's a lot of other aspects in the middle there. Um, so lots you can configure, lots that can go wrong, but also other services where you really just don't have that level of control and you're transferring risk to the cloud provider. So when we talk about designing a cloud security program, we're looking at a lot of different, we're looking at it from different perspectives. Um, I kind of broke it down into a couple different areas. So we look at you know, the architecture of your whole organization in the cloud. Um, and that's infrastructure, it's uh, you know, how, where your apps are based, what your networking looks like is also in there. Um, you know, IAM, and then also securing your CI/CD pipeline, um, and securing the actual deployed applications that go into the cloud. Um, you know, and then 
when you're all, when you're looking at this this uh, cloud security program, you also have to look at you know your logging and monitoring, what level, what kind of data you have, how you're protecting it, um, you know, to to what extent you're um, concerned about any loss of that data. So this is you know something like governance and compliance also comes into that as you see later later down the slide. Um, resilience in DR is often a little bit easier because cloud services have a lot of that built in already, uh, or it's easily configured. So this is just kind of a general overview of, of all the different ways that you can approach evaluating your cloud security or your, your cloud security posture as an organization. So really briefly, I'm gonna just talk about AWS accounts and securing a single account. So essentially your AWS account is what you start with if you're just getting into the cloud. It is uh, a single instance, and it essentially is a container for all the services that you want to run. It also forms a natural, well, <laughs> AWS says natural, um, but it's kind of a default security boundary. Like, yes, you can link accounts together, you can have cross-account permissions, but as a default, when you create an account, it is kind of this isolated environment in which you place your resources, and then you scope down further based on the resources that are in that account. So it's, it kind of has that, that functionality. Uh, and within an account, um, you're gonna have regions, you can have availability zones, VPCs, and uh, well, there's, there's a lot of other things you can put in there, but you know, it gets so small in the slide you wouldn't be able to understand it, so won't go that far. Uh, and then serverless services live kind of outside that, that uh, structure. So that's generally what an account is. And securing that account is also an incredibly important part of your security posture. Whether you are uh, using one account or whether you're using multiple accounts, these are always gonna be important factors. Um, so your root user, main user of your account, is you know, it's the primary administrator. You can do everything from it, which means you should not use it. <laughs> so what you wanna do is make sure that um, you have absolutely lock down access to the account. And unfortunately, it's not the case that you can just, you know, lock it away and throw, or lock it up and throw away the keys the way you would with, you know, the Linux box or something. Um, there are some functions that you're only able to run um, from that. So uh, you can't just, can't just lock it away, and, you know, ignore it. Um, but what you can do is make sure that access is very severely restricted. So, one thing that comes up actually is um, an email account associated with that root user. That's one method for resetting a password. So you actually want to also secure the email account that the root user is associated with. Um, and that can mean, you know, I mean, primarily what you should be doing is using shared accounts, not like, you know, some random person's account, um, <laughs> which, you know, even in organizations, we've definitely seen that before. Um, so, you know, enable MFA. Um, make sure that the MFA method, if it's a hardware token or if it's a virtual MFA, making sure that that is also stored in a place where access is restricted and can be revoked quickly if someone leaves a company or something like that. Um, and you can also have break glass accounts. You can't have everything with MFA because if MFA fails, you're kind of SOL. So you wanna make sure that if you are using a break glass account like this, that it is very tightly controlled and it has the maximum of monitoring associated with it. And the other thing I'll call out, billing alerts. Please set up billing alerts. That should be like the first thing that you do. <laughs> Last thing you want is, you know, to, to have someone go rogue in the account, whether it's a compromise or just someone who doesn't know how the cloud can get really expensive really quick and then suddenly you have a $10,000 bill because I'm sure that's never happened to anyone. I think, I think the most I've done accidentally was like 50 bucks and I consider myself lucky. <laughs> so that's an account. That's how we secure an account. An account is one of multiple accounts in an organization. And organizations from this point is organizations as a service. So it is, it is an AWS service that is essentially a, how you create a collection of accounts and manage them. So it's essentially a, it's a structure similar, probably similar to like Active Directory OUs, like you can have nested OUs in Active Directory. It's, it's pretty much the same idea, um, just in the cloud. 
and um, provides you the ability to centrally manage accounts um, to secure those environments by grouping them within organizational units or OUs. And then what you can do is actually scope access down using service control policies to limit what any user within those nested accounts can actually do um, in, in expand that to a group. So it can be like, if you want the same level of permissions for you know, five different accounts, then you can use a service control policy or SCP to do that. And we'll get into those a little bit more. So why use multiple accounts? Well, as I mentioned before, an account is a logical security boundary or natural. Now, I say that, but you can absolutely configure it to be incredibly unsafe. So this really comes down to just making sure that you have an idea of how you actually want to connect things. But when you're going into this, what you want to do is logically group accounts by purpose, not by hierarchy or, or anything related to HR, but by what they're going to be used for, because that's going to determine the level of permissions that, um, that you're going to grant to users within those accounts. Um, having a multi-account environment essentially reduces blast radius because it means if a whole account gets popped, it's not your entire environment. It's just one account. So if you have you know, a, a production application in one account, and then you have um, you know, your HR system in a different one, you don't cross-contaminate if one of those um, environments gets compromised. Um, and then another really good feature is you can centrally manage billing and billing alerts, which uh, really just helps kind of keep costs very transparent um, and set different different kind of alerts based on like OUs and that type of thing. So very, very useful. Um, and the other thing is, um, I put in here compliance. I hate compliance. Like PCI is the most annoying thing I've ever dealt with. <laughs> I don't ever want to touch it again. But they really love when you separate things. Like if you tell them it's like, oh, it's, this is all the way over here in its own box and it's like this is other, in its other little box. You, I mean, you could probably configure it wrong, but they would still look at that and be like, oh, that's great. <laughs> so really useful for compliance as well. So it, what I talked about AWS accounts, I talked about securing the root user of an account. Uh, in AWS organizations, at the top of your, of your organization's tree, you actually have a management account. And that is like root of root, essentially, this management account. So you have a root user within the management account, and that you really need to lock down because it has permissions for the entire organization. And your, your management account, you shouldn't even be using unless you absolutely need to. I think there are some like um, billing functions that you can't do anywhere else, um, but other than that, you should not touch it. You should delegate as much as possible away from that account because it is absolutely crucial to the security of your organization. And a lot of the same stuff applies. So you want to use a group or shared email account that has a limited amount of access, you know, and I don't want to hear that that email account is like local exchange from 2000 whatever. <laughs> And that, you know, basic auth is enabled, there's no MFA, so please don't do that. Like, think all the way over. <laughs> it's not just security in the cloud, it's security of everything that gets into the cloud, everything that gets you to that point. So, very important point there. Obviously, you know, you want to use a complex password. That's, I, I would consider that essential, but, I mean, there, there are still places that don't actually do these basic things, so it's worth repeating. Um, you know, enabling MFA, you probably want to have some kind of break glass as well that's heavily locked down and um, restricted and, and monitored as well. Um, and also, you want to have a, an elevated amount of logging for any activity within this account because of just how high risk it is. So very important to lock that down. So organizational units, or OUs, similar to act, very similar to Active Directory, and this is like it's the same idea. Um, they, like I mentioned, represent logical groupings of accounts. And um, this, this is kind of, we'll talk about a couple of these different ones, but um, AWS actually has the, um, re has reference architecture where it breaks down kind of what you want this structure to look like. So I'm gonna dive into a couple of these different areas just to talk about what, um, kind of what they are, what types of accounts they have in them, and how you would use them. Um, but the nice thing is you can actually use OUs to run specific services, supported services, from just one account. So you don't need to go deploy 
you know, a certain service in every single account in your organization because that's a pain in the ass and it's a lot of configuring. And when you do that, you introduce drift and other issues. So, um, yeah. And you can, certain services, you can also delegate administration to other accounts, which is going to be very useful. Um, so the first organizational unit that's recommended in AWS's service, uh, the recommended architecture, is security tooling account. This is going to be the base for all of your security services. So there are certain services that you can run centrally that will apply and look for activity across your whole organization, or across all your accounts. Um, and that security hub, guard duty, config, there's a few others that I didn't list here. But these are essentially services that you can deploy in an account inside this security, uh, inside the security OU to essentially be the base operations. And what that means is you can actually just have specific people that work in the security, you know, that work on cloud security, the security of your organization, and they, can, they only need access to one account. So they don't need access to every single other thing because they're only, they only need to access one of these services in, in that specific account. So again, logical grouping by function. Um, and there's also log archive account, which you should absolutely be using. Um, and that is what, you, what you're basically using it for is to have S3 buckets that collect the logs that you're then going to export to a SIM or XDR service or whatever you're using to, um, to actually look at the data that comes out of AWS. So an important point about this, this is really such a clear cut case for having that limited to one account because a lot of SIM integration or XDR integration relies on having an IAM user that has access to the account. And anytime you have external access granted to an account, you know, you kind of need some amount of, of ability to like make sure that it's, there's no potential for privilege escalation or you know, lateral movement or anything like that. So having, all of, having an entire account just dedicated to saving logs and limiting access to those logs to just, you know, to just that account is a really great way to really enforce that isolation and that security boundary. Uh, so the other organiza organizational unit that AWS recommends is infrastructure. This one, there's actually a couple other things in it that I didn't list just in the interest of simplicity. Um, one of them is a network account. And um, generally it's recommended to use a hub and spoke model instead of just doing a lot of like peering across the different accounts. So each account kind of connects to a central account. That central account can manage things like um, all your you know, gateways and things like that. And also um, that's where you can base any of your inspection tools. So like having a firewall, um, any other IDS, intrusion detection systems, that, that type of stuff can be based out of one account. And again, it's a great example of being able to say you grant a specific set of people access to that account, and then you don't need to worry about having them have access to everything, so they need to configure everything. I'm not a networking expert, but this definitely makes it a little easier to like just have a, a centralized view of a, all of your networking. And then there's shared services as well. Um, this one essentially just runs services that are shared by all the applications. So it's actually, <laughs> the name actually makes sense, which is great. Um, so you can centralize things like Systems Manager, um, AWS Managed Microsoft AD, which is just like an Active Directory integration. You know, you can use Active Directory integration for VMs and other services. So you can basically manage that centrally instead of, again, doing that in individual accounts. And then the last one to talk about, this is just kind of a broad category. Workloads are what's actually running in the cloud. You know, if you're hosting web application or internal tooling, something like that, like this is the, the OU that you would put it under. And one very strong recommendation that I think is just, there's no question that you should be doing this, is to separate out prod and non-prod. And whether, you know, non-prod can be like dev, test, stage, like it, any of that should absolutely be separated uh, into their own accounts and away from production. Um, and you know, this is really where you want to have that strong security boundary. You want to be able to, to know that there's a limit to what any, any compromise can actually accomplish. And this is a great way to do that. Oh yeah, and then the last point about that that I, I just caught that I wrote on my slide actually was um, 
that's it's also a great way to keep you know to keep certain developers to limit your developer access to a production environment because you're probably going to have a lot more people involved in the development process that might need access versus production which should be very very limited so very important um, consideration there does anyone have questions so far by the way it's a pretty small group so it shouldn't be too bad all right cool I'm hoping this is just like, it's so brilliant and it's all sinking in. I'm gonna tell myself that anyways. Either that or just like, what is going on? <laughs> Could be either one. Um, so the next thing we're gonna talk about, my favorite thing that I'm really getting into, is service control policies. So if you're familiar with IAM and writing IAM policies, if you've dug into that a lot, it's essentially the same thing, but at an organizational level uh, and applying to multiple um, different OUs or accounts or, or other entities. So essentially, that's what they are. They enforce permissions, permission, they're the guardrails in this talk. They're like, you know, the, the very uh, rigid path that a, you know, a user can take within an account. Um, so they apply to the OU and the account level. Uh, you can use them to define maximum available permissions. So going back to that like dev prod, you know, you might have like, you might say there is absolutely no reason that an account needs external access to the internet. So you can lock that down using a service control policy. So you don't need to write it into an actual IEM policy. Uh, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of things you can do with them. And I'm going to actually talk through a couple examples. So one um, policy that we use really frequently and we see it pretty much everywhere that's great is re uh, restricting by region. So most services can be launched in pretty much any region, and that is a really great way to, um, <laughs> to hide things. I mean, if I was gonna pop an environment, I'd be like, let me just spin up you know, a crypto miner in like, you know, EU West 1 or something if, if the company's in US East 2, because it might take a little bit longer to figure out that something is actually there. Um, and for consistency, for visibility, you, know, you might wanna actually just have everything in the same, in the same region. That kind of makes sense. Um, so this one's a really good one. And I know that's really, really small. It's, it's JSON. If you don't know JSON, go learn JSON. It's, it's super easy and it, it it's where everything is defined in AWS, so it makes sense to, to learn it. So what, how this breaks down is you essentially have a statement that contains all of your information and you have a section that's gonna define what actions are affected and that can be literally you know anything that you that you choose to add in this case in this specific example it's actually um, a list of services that can't be um, restricted by region so anything that can be restricted by region is going to be affected by this policy the next one down is which resource so maybe there are like some things you'd launch in in a different region but, and there's some that you wouldn't. In this case, we're saying this applies to any, any resource across the board. Um, and the effect is deny, so this is, this is a deny policy. Under condition, this is where things can get really awesome and creative because you can use it to really refine and you, you can use it to make exceptions, which we'll see. Um, and, but in this case, it's string not equals AWS requested region US East one. So this is a lot of deny, we're getting like, you know, double negatives here. <laughs> but essentially what this policy does is it says, unless a, a resource, any resource is being launched in US East 1, don't, don't allow it to happen. And it will just error out. It'll give a very vague error too, which is like not useful because I tried to do this at one point and then I forgot I'd apply this SAP and I'm like, why isn't it working? It spent me like, spent like 10 minutes trying to figure out why it wasn't working. Um, but you know, this is a, essentially, this is probably like one of the core SCPs that I would use because it's easy to implement. You can impl implement it on pretty much every OU and um, it, it's just, I don't know, I, I think it's, it just applies to everything. So a really, it's a really good one. Uh, the next one is um, locking down network configuration. Uh, there, there are a whole lot of different examples for this. There's also a link um, that I share in the slides, and I'll, I'll um, list the GitHub after for that, that actually has, there's a whole page that just has a ton of pre-made SCPs, and they're, they're really great. So I pulled a lot of examples from that. There were a lot of different network examples, um, too many to fit on one slide, unfortunately. 
but this is kind of an important one because, as I mentioned earlier, you might not want to have your, you know, your dev, someone in your dev environment granting anything external access. You might want to say, like, no internet gateway, no, you know, um, transit gateways, things like that. Uh, so this is a great one to use if you want to make sure that something really stays internal and you want to block anyone that even attempts to change that. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, I mean, the reason to do that also is because if you have, you know, a compromise and someone in your environment wants to exfiltrate data or connect to a, you know, C2 or download malware or something, you know, they might want to add some, some internet connectivity to actually do that and this uh, SCP would prevent them from creating the resources needed. I wouldn't want to say it prevents them entirely because there is no such thing as, you know, completely secure and I'm sure there are ways around it. Um, but overall, it's, it's definitely something that um, helps kind of make that really hard to do. And then, so for this one, it actually looks a little bit simpler. I'm, I'm looking at the slides like I can't even read my own slides, so I apologize for that. <laughs> um, so this actually has two, two different chunks. There, and it's just kind of a grouping of actions. It doesn't change how it works. But essentially, it's deny every single resource under these actions. Like, nothing, none of these actions can be done at all. Um, one, um, one piece of guidance that AWS has that is, is absolutely worth noting is you want to make sure you, first of all, test SCPs before <laughs> rolling them into production to make sure they don't do things that you didn't expect. Um, and also to apply them, you know, not, uh, you do not want any of them at the root level. I don't even know if you can do that, but if you can, don't make sure it's always on a nested OU so you have a lot of control over undoing it <laughs> if, um, if you run into issues. So, like I mentioned, network, the network aspect kind of, um, you know, there's a lot of different things that you could actually do with this. So, like I mentioned earlier and showed, there's a conditions block. And the conditions block, if you, look, if you actually look at it, has a lot of different options. So what you could do with this is say, well, okay, maybe there's like a specific group that can make changes. So what you could do is you add a condition block that says, you know, deny unless it's this set of users or this role, like probably a role or something like that. Um, and you could also, you know, change the, the services. So maybe you, you know, you want to limit some things but not others. Um, and then, you know, you can lock down like all network settings. So this is like a small section, but you could basically really restrict who has access to do that. And the great thing is you're doing it at the OU level. So if you have this in your workloads OU, or you know, it may be in like, you know, a, applying to production accounts, then effectively you don't have to go into every single account and apply it multiple times. You just apply it once to the whole OU, and then it will apply to everything nested under that. Every nested OU, every nested account. So really, really powerful tools. Um, there are lots of other SCPs. Uh, I mean, just absolutely tons. So there's a couple examples here, but um, again, I'll, I'll be sharing the slides, so you'll be able to see, go to the website and look at the whole list. It's like probably hundreds. Um, there's some other really cool ones. Um, I kind of like this. Require a tag on, spe on specified created resources. So you can use tags in conditions. You use tags to logically organize, you know, what kind of resources within an account. So requiring that a tag be used when creating a resource can be a, a really great way to make sure that you, you get that consistency without ha it having being a policy that someone should follow and rather a you can't actually create a resource without doing that. Um, there also um, are a couple around preventing users from disabling or changing certain services. So AWS config is one, CloudTrail for example, like you wanna make sure no one can disable CloudTrail or CloudWatch. Um, and you use SCPs to, to lock down those services as well. All right, so I have a few slides on logging as well. Before I continue, is there, were there any questions on SCPs? Other than why can I not apply them all for my entire organization? <laughs> Oh, awesome, cool. I'm glad you're getting something out of it. Dead silence is always kind of a little scary. <laughs> so logging. TLDR, you should always be logging many things. 
I will not say, however, you should export and use all of those logs because if you have a Splunk instance, you're kind of screwed and you're gonna regret everything. So don't do that. <laughs> but you do need logging. Um, so there's actually CloudTrail integration for AWS organizations. One thing I actually did not mention um, in, at the beginning of this is, I'm sure a few of you have heard of AWS Control Tower. So Control Tower is an, is an other service and I'm gonna like touch on that briefly at the end. Um, but CloudTrail deployment across multiple accounts in an organization works completely differently in organizations versus Control Tower. So if you're actually using Control Tower, it doesn't look the same. And if you're gonna try to move from just using organizations to Control Tower, it's gonna be a pain in the ass. <laughs> just fair warning. <laughs> um, so CloudTrail for organizations specifically, organizations as a service. So you can centralize logging across all your accounts with organizational CloudTrail, which essentially is what it sounds like. It just creates those, those trails in every single account and collects that API access activity that, that you wanna actually keep an eye on. Um, and then what you're gonna do is, as we talked about, we have this log archive account, um, which has S3 buckets. So what you're gonna do is actually configure that AWS organizational cloud trail to save to that, you know, an S3 bucket in your log archive account. And then, you know, you work with your, whatever your SIM is to get those logs exported hopefully parsed and, and filtered <laughs> quite a lot because CloudTrail is a fire hose, it is a fire hose of information. Um, and you can then, you know, as we talked about, use SCPs and AWS config to make sure that that's, that configuration sticks and that no one can modify it after the fact. Um, CloudWatch events also integrates with organizations. So um, you can basically use alerts to, to alert on um, organizational actions like creating accounts, deleting accounts, trying to remove member accounts, things like that. And that's definitely information that you wanna keep an eye on. So it applies both within the accounts themselves and also to the organization as a whole. So that's, and you always wanna monitor any organizational level activity as closely as possible. And even more so to your, any break glass account. Um, so centralizing within your log archive account, what you're gonna wind up with is a, a number of different sets of logs. So we talked about CloudTrail, we talked about CloudWatch events, cloud, other parts of CloudWatch as well that aren't like organization specific. Um, you know, you wanna send your VPC flow logs in. There's no like organization deployment for that, so it kinda has to be configured in each account, which is mildly annoying, but it's AWS, so they'll probably change that in three months and then I'll give this talk again and someone will be like, actually, they changed something. Cloud changing something? Never. <laughs> So, yeah, you want to have a VPC flow log sent to that log archive account also for export. And then you have so many different kinds of service level logging. I wasn't even going to list many examples, but pretty much any service that you're running is going to have some amount of logging. So if you're doing something like, um, like Elasticache has, has alert, has like logging, you know, RDS, relational database service, EC2s at the data plane level, like there are so many different logs that you can collect and you wanna make sure that when you're doing that, you're sending them to a central location. So again, when you have some kind of SIM integration or other tooling that pulls those logs out, that it's, you know, that access is limited just to that one account. Very important. So plenty, plenty of logs to play with and uh, money to spend on Splunk. <laughs> or Sentinel, maybe, maybe Sentinel. Um, and just the last thing I'm gonna to touch on, like I, like I mentioned, um, Control Tower is also something that organizations will use. It's kind of, um, I would say like an extension on AWS organizations. A lot of what Control Tower does is actually like based on organizations. They just kind of rename it. And to be perfectly transparent, I'm not an expert <laughs> on Control Tower at all. I barely understand it. Uh, it's kind of the next thing on the list. Um, but I've definitely seen it, and I've seen, again, with, like with the logging thing, it, there are some things that it does differently that is frustrating enough that if you're already u just using organizations, you wanna do your research before trying to add Control Tower to the mix. One important point here, too, Control Tower costs money. It is not free. Organizations is free. Uh, I actually ran a training at B-Sides Charm in May that is like AWS organizations training, and the whole thing is free tier, basically. 
and I, I accidentally left one thing running and it cost like two dollars. So um, yeah, it's on my GitHub if, uh, if you want to take a look at that. But with Control Tower, you, it just allows for more control over orchestrating. Um, thank you. <laughs> for orchestrating um, the creation of new accounts um, and kind of create, just basically templatizing account creation. So Control Tower just gives you more of that granular control. You can also manage multiple AWS organizations. It's funny, the longer I've been doing cloud security, the more I find myself like zooming out. I'm like, you know, oh my God, like, oh, secure at the service level. Like, you know, here's how you secure Lambda. And then, oh, here's how you secure, you know, uh, EC2, and then your VPC, and then your account. And now you just took a step back and you looked at organizations. And now it's like, oh my God, multiple organizations? Well, if you're, you know, um, a managed service provider, then you might use Control Tower for managing multiple organizations because you have different clients. So that is uh, definitely, definitely um, a little daunting at first, but it, it's pretty cool. Like I said, I've got to play with it more. Um, and it has these four different things, uh, four different features. So your landing, landing zone is essentially like this um, multi-account environment, kind of your AWS organization, um, structured like the recommendations that um, we talked about earlier that come from the reference architecture. Um, guardrails, so guardrails is essentially just built on service control policies. So if you understand SCPs, guardrails are not, hopefully not too different. Again, not an expert here, but it's, it's pretty close. And that's also like, I love how the AWS is just like, let's name services normal words to make it really confusing. <laughs> I'm talking about guardrails and I'm not talking about control tower guardrails, I'm just talking about lowercase guardrails. Very confusing, thanks AWS. <laughs> um, so account factory, this is pretty cool. So you can actually configure kind of a template to standardize provisioning new accounts. And this is great because if you just create a new account raw, like, you know, you might have like a, sp a specific set of things that you want to configure in the account. And you don't want to have to do that repeatedly. You could, I mean, you probably should be doing something like, you know, infrastructure as code, Terraform, the favorite thing. But if you're using Control Tower, then you can actually do that with Control Tower and it's, it's already built in. And then, you know, a dashboard, it's kind of, it's a dashboard. It's basically a dashboard. There's really nothing more complicated than that. Maybe there is, I don't know. You could tell me I'm full of crap. <laughs> but um, yeah, so those are, the, those are the features of Control Tower. I think it's kind of like, it's a good thing to know about and do a little bit of research into. Um, but to me, the more important point out of all of that is actually just to understand what organiza AWS organizations is and how to use it. And I would even say, if you're like a small business, if you're a nonprofit, I'm involved in running one, and you know, still use organizations. It's free. It's gonna help you get control over your whole environment. Because the last thing you want is you're a small business and the one person that created the AWS account just like up and left, and you're like, I don't have access to this anymore. You don't wanna do that. With organizations, for free, you can create that management account, list that, you know, have a, another account under it, and then you have oversight and, and the ability to actually protect that account and manage it from the root of the organization. So really, really, really useful stuff. And it's kind of fun to play with. So that's basically, those are, those are my essential guardrails. Not control tower, but the, the regular normal guardrails. So I actually wanted to ask what, like any of these questions. So, you know, it, is anyone here in a, working for an organization where they're actually using AWS organizations or Control Tower? Don't know. <laughs> Hi, I thought I recognized you. <laughs> I, you know, the Control Tower. I actually have not heard about it. The only reason why I, I kind. Of, I kind of know all the stuff that you talked about because I was trying to study for our certification. So the control tower, when did it come out? Did it just, is, is that something recent or has it, I just haven't paid attention to. I, you know, I'm not actually sure. Okay. I, I feel it's been at least been like a few years. Oh, okay, a few years. But I think it, it also, it's so like corporate and paid that it's probably not like in the mix for like any free training or, you know, oh, yeah, I always want yeah. to go for the free training. <laughs> um, 
Okay, that sounds fine. So I, I know you showed a trial. Oh, I'm interested in the tower, just so I want to learn it. You showed up at the, the template. I think you can use cloud formation to do that kind of stuff, right? So it's, it is part of this ex more expensive thing, but you can do it, okay. I just wanted to double check on that. No, I, I'm not using the tower. Um, I'm using the free tier. So, um, okay, that's all I have. Um, thank you, Muteki, for the presentation. Thank you, Linux girl. <laughs> Anyone else want to ask any questions or anything? Yeah, or? Uh, for your SCP example, you showed how you can control and manage some people's actions um, within your organization. When somebody triggers or hits one of those, do you actually get a log event for that activity? It's funny, I had on my, my list of things to add is to, was to actually like look at the CloudTrail logs. So, I'm assuming yes, because with CloudTrail logs, you can see like failed API activity. So yeah, it should show up. And it is something you could alert on. That was gonna be my second question. So based <laughs> off of that, since you have your log archive account, can you actually filter there before sending to your SIM? Or do you have to accept everything that you archive? So you can use, I think you could use CloudWatch event, events to like trigger on specific things and that would kind of default filter. Okay. Um, there are some other tools you can use. So I haven't personally used it, but Athena is kind of a query, a query engine that you can put on top of CloudTrail logs to kind of analyze that activity. Overall though, what, what I've mostly seen organizations do and what I've done personally, and uh, I also run, a, um, I do Azure and so I helped engineer an XCR service. What we would do is actually just pull the logs directly into a, like a log collection, um, tool like we've used Cribble, um, but you could use like Logstash or something like that and just do the filtering there before export to something else. Okay, cool. So you could specifically have like a filter that's like fail, you know, failed organization level activity, for example, you know, and that make sure that that passes through all the way to your SIM or some other alerting tool. Okay, cool, thank you. Let me check the chat real quick. Cool, thanks. <laughs> uh, uh, so we have a question from the uh, chat from uh, Unix uh, Geekum. Uh, regarding billing, is it possible to alarm if charges are up by a certain percentage over the last month or if it uh, fixed amounts? And are there any other billing alarm best practices? And I'll just add to this, this is a great indicator if you have a crypto problem or some resource abuse if you've been compromised. That's a really good question. I, I feel like you can do that and AWS has a couple different tools for managing like budgets and then there's like more like billing specific tools. I don't know the exact answer to that but I would be really shocked if you couldn't do like percentage increase. Like I'd be really shocked because that, that feels like it should be pretty basic. One would think, one would think. <laughs> Anything else? Uh, Emily do, uh, from chat, did you have any other questions in regards to her comment or? I do have a question if uh, uh, we have 10 more minutes if you wanna yeah. I can ask a fairly broad question for you. Um, so this is a bunch of uh, suggestions on and everything for best practices on what to do. Could you give us some examples of like what happens if you don't do these things and where they can go wrong? Because those horror stories give a lot of context on why you want to do these things. And that could be its, its own talk itself. Oh man, um, I didn't, so I I specifically do a, a consulting in engineering and architecture, so I haven't seen too many horror stories, but. What I have definitely heard of is organizations configuring things in a way that they think works and actually doesn't, <laughs> and le that leaving other things exposed. So I think like a lot of the, the network configuration stuff, like, like things are set up in a way that doesn't work correctly and, and then could be exploited later. And personally, I, I also feel like just having these kinds of, of guardrails in place and just defining it before building it just prevents so many issues. Because I feel like in, in some of the, the assessments that we've done, we've seen a lot of potential huge problems. And some of those being like, 
you know, not knowing who has access to the root account of, of the organization. Like, that's kind of a major thing. Um, and it's not even just a matter of a security compromise, but also a usability thing. I mean, you know, you want resilience and everything else as well as security. So definitely important to have that. And then, like, you know, I've seen, like, environments where there is literally no logging. Like, literally, it happens. <laughs> That's the thing. Like you come into a talk and you're like, well, of course that makes sense. Like, why wouldn't anyone do that? But there are plenty of instances where that is the case. And with no, you know, with no actual logging or alerting, this whole whole account, this whole organization could be compromised, and you wouldn't even know until you got the bill, maybe. <laughs> Assuming you're also not setting up billing accounts. Yeah, I bet you have more war stories than I do about compromises. <laughs> I'll just say there's always the person who sets up a uh, system and then goes, wait, the logging's not enabled by default? And that turns into a misadventure. Uh, there weren't any other questions from chat, but okay. Um, first of all, just a comment. I think what I learned from other people is, you know, the responsibility, you have a responsibility, a customer has. You can't think AWS is going to take care of everything for you. I think that's the impression. I put everything on, on the cloud, and magically security is going to be taken care of, OK? <laughs> so I think that's absolutely the first thing I learned was that, you know, customer has your, you have your own responsibility. I, I do have a question. I don't, because I don't remember. Is it everything by default is locked down, right? Everything is denied unless you open up the SAP. Is that currently how it is right now? Uh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. I, I thought maybe the best way to do it is everything is default denied, now you just open up the whatever, the yeah, permissions. I, okay, it's not like as that. As much as okay. like my heart wants to say that's a great, a great idea, then you wouldn't really be able to do anything, and then right, you that know, would probably blow up. <laughs> until your d developer starts screaming, then you open it up. No, just kidding. <laughs> I, I mean, like, the funny thing is, you know, I, I know you know this, because I know you, but you know, the, from the developer perspective, that's like a whole other way of approaching cloud security too. And taking that and combining it with kind of the overall cloud security assessment perspective, it's, it kind of winds up with this complete opposite approach to everything. And that is like, that's a great reason, reason to use an SCP. It's like, mm -hmm. so, so one of the things that um, is in the uh, recommended security architecture that um, I didn't get a chance to cover is actually a sandbox account, like in a whole OU that's sandboxes. And what you would actually do is have an entire account, a sandbox account for your developers to just completely mess up. And you can just delete the whole account afterwards. And you can put you know, an SCP on it that like, you can only access, you, you can't modify any of the networking permissions. So you can only access it from like, you know, approved locations or by approved entities. And that's great because you can give your developers the flexibility mm -hmm. to actually like, muck around and, and play around and learn stuff, because I think you know, most people are, are hands-on learners, without sacrificing the rest of your organization to do so. So great use for that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Hi, that was um, one of the questions that I had, was talking about the CI CD pipeline and separating kind of prod versus the non-prod staging testing environments um, and architecting that maybe after uh, something's already been set up. Do you have any advice or best practices for how do you help organizations sort of get set down that like right road? Yeah, I've definitely had those conversations before and my usual advice is to like, start slow and just kind of introduce things. I, th I think the, the problem you run into as people in security is like, we need to lock down all the things. And at the same time, you know, you have developers trying to get shit done and we want usability to be a consideration. So I think, so, so I've seen a couple different ways to do this. And the best one I saw was basically like, you know, um, you have security all the way from starting with the local, local development environment. You know, secure maybe a secure VM, um, sign git commits, a lot of checks along the stages of the of the devel de bleh, development life cycle. You know, and then it's it gets committed to a, a git repo, and there's like you know there's a trigger that deploys it. The best by far is to take IAM out of AWS as much as possible, and put the weight of of that kind of in the like in in the pipeline process and not like in AWS. The worst things I've seen is like, 
yeah, we're gonna like throw Jenkins on an EC2 instance and stick it in an account and we kind of have to open it pretty wide up and well, the only thing I know about Jenkins personally is that um, one of the people I trust the most on CICD stuff hates it because it's so, well also loves it because he's also a red teamer and it's so easy to pop. So, <laughs> um, but, but the best one is basically like if you have any kind of integration where you can like, you know, restrict access by repos and then have, you know, repos have access to a specific part of the AWS environment. Maybe it has an, a managed identity of some kind and it assumes a role to actually do these things so that your developer, even for production, never even needs to go into the environment and do anything. That is really the ideal place to be. But it really comes down to like looking at where you are now, looking at where you wanna be and taking it like step by step. Do that continuous integration for the security process as well as the software process. That was really helpful, thank you. Thanks. Oh, uh, slight plug, I'm also talking about that exact topic at DEF CON Cloud Village on Friday. <laughs> Yeah, should uh, be fun. So we have three minutes left. Does anyone else have any other questions or? I'll just double check chat real quick. <laughs> Do you want to <laughs> And I'll have one last question for you just to kind of wrap things up. Uh, from all your experience on anything, is there anything particular you've seen uh, most common in terms of misconfigurations uh, that you would highly recommend people just they would normally overlook or not think about or anything else that you consistently see or something that comes up in your mind in that way? That's a good question. I feel like a lot of it is just kind of the log centralization, but another, I mean the other big thing is like kind of a lack of understanding about IAM permissions. Like IAM is the security boundary. It is the new security perimeter. You know, we, we come from this like on-premise mentality where it's like, oh, it's a firewall and it's this, this enclosed environment, but that's just not the case in the cloud. IAM is so important and if you're not, if you're not, if you don't understand it and you're not following best practices with it, like that's what's gonna get you in the most trouble. Because you can have all the logging alerting in the world, you can have all of your, your other permissions set, but if your IAM is not good, like someone can escalate all the way to, you know, quote unquote domain admin for, for cloud, you know, for, for uh, these root accounts. And IAM is really the only thing that's gonna, at the core of it really prevents that. So good IAM best practices. Like use roles, don't use, don't just attach policies to users, use roles. Yep. Awesome, thank you, that was a great answer. Uh, <laughs> and that's all it for questions, if, uh, if you wanna take it away with your last slide. Yep, and I'll be posting it on GitHub, which is, I mean, maybe not that readable, but um, muteki-apps, and I'm muteki underscore RTW on Twitter as well. Always happy to answer questions. Thank you.